much. Audio. Okay, um, let's share screen. So today we are going to do, um, sorry, one second. I gotta do that so I don't have to convert things later. Okay, we are gonna work with Windows certificates. So for the client and Windows 10, you can view your certificate. So I want for you to really visualize how certificates play a role in encryption. And so you're gonna see that and also the digital signature. You on your smartphone use certificates all the time. Every time that you use a secure website, every time that you play a game or use an app and so on. So to start, um, what we're gonna use is we are gonna use Microsoft Management Console. This console is used to integrate snap-ins for administration purposes. So if you plan to work with Windows system, you will see Microsoft Management Console in server and regular um, client OS. So there are three categories of certificate. You have the local system, which is assigned to the device. So it could be your mobile phone or it could be your computers. Then you also have certificate that's assigned to users. And you see that a lot on the network environment. And based on the certificate, it will determine what that user is capable of, um, the permissions that's associated with different objects in the network. Then you have the service account, and this is stored to a particular service. And so it ties to different type of services. So for example, encryption is a form of service. So you have a certificate that will be affiliate with encryption if we require encryption, for example, email application that requires encryption, okay? So on your Windows PC, you are going to search. So click the search option and we are gonna look for MMC, which stands for Microsoft Management Console. And here, uh, what we want is we can run it as administrator, okay, or just regular, that doesn't matter. So this is a blank template for MMC. And every time you edit MMC, you can save like your console template or your console to as you add the snap in. So one of the things that we can add is our tool set. And our tool, tool set in Microsoft is called snap in. Okay, so on this step, you are gonna click file and then you are gonna do add or remove snap in. So click file, add or remove snap in. And this is where you would get a list of tools that you can use. So one of the tool that we can use is the certificate manager. And this allows you to view certificate. Keep in mind that we're using a client system, not a server. So on the server end, you can install a role called certificate authority where it can issue certificate to the client system like your Windows 10. So we are gonna select certificate and then we're gonna choose add. And later on, you might have to add many different tools like your group policy, um, event viewer, different things that we use for security. So when you add, we are gonna choose computer account and then we're gonna go next. Okay, this one, the third option. Now, if you want the user account, which is we're gonna see in command prompt down the line, you can choose that, but right now we're gonna use computer account. We're gonna go next. Since we're not connected to a server, you know, specifically, we do connect to other server to get IP address and DNS information but we, we're not remote connecting. So we are gonna choose local system and click finish. So it's gonna tell you that it's gonna show you certificates for your local system. So what step am I at here? I'm at the next one. Okay, number five. And then we're gonna click okay. So it's gonna look like this, okay. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna see the certificates now. Okay, so here, if you want to expand this, you can just simply click that. So it would give you these folders 
that will contain different type of certificates. And so as we talked about how the trusted model for the certificate, how it's obtaining that from different entity for the certificate authority. So as you can see, there are different authorities based on the categories of the certificate. So for example, if I'm using a third party application like Adobe, right? A lot of us are using Adobe for different things to read Adobe files, to edit pictures, and so on, that is actually obtained by the certificate authority that's under the third party category, okay? So you would see, and so if you're using smart card system, for example, to enter and leave the building, you would also have to trust the smart card uh, system as it would use a, a different authority there. Okay, so once you expand the certificate to look at your options, you are going to click on trusted certification authority. So here, I'm going to go here, trusted root. Okay, so I need to click the trust root to expand it. And I can look at the certificate by clicking on the certificate there. So as you can see, all of these are the trusted roots. And it doesn't necessarily come from RCCD, right? It could be, and if you look at the issue by, those are the issuer, it can come from like GoDaddy, it can come from Microsoft, it can come from different, different type of issuer, okay? So here, how do I know how many? It's gonna tell you how many on the bottom here. It says 50 certificates. So I can put that down as my answer. So we can look, look at the bottom of the window and we would see 50 certificates. And you can also categorize them. They are alphabetized by ascending order, A through Z. But if you're looking for a certain type of certificate, you can simply click the tab to sort it, right? For example, I wanna sort by expiration date. I can click the tab. I can, I can sort it by issue by and so on. So that can help you quickly narrow down the ones that you want to find, okay? And then the status and, and the information is empty, but you would see, right, the purpose, a lot of it is for like authentication, as you can see. Most of the certificate that you see from the trusted root is often for authentication. Any question? Okay. Then what we want to do is we wanted to see if there's anything that's expired. Okay, so you want to look for things that for the year past, like this one. I have, and you can drag this back and forth so you can see more. So the Ad Trust external CA here, it shows that the expiration date is 2020. That means that it's expired. So I have one, I have another one down here, 2021, the DS root. Okay, I have another one, my global sign, 2021, and so on. So if these certificates are not renewed, that means that they are no longer effective, but they're still there because they are files that store the information for a specific event that would relate to different things, right? Like as you can see, okay? So I do have quite a few and you can just give me like, you don't have, you can count them. There's some stuff from 2004 old, right? So like maybe six, seven on, on these, on this image, at least that's what they're using. So I'll just put seven. And so I want you to be able to use this exercise so you can examine like how you can find certificate. Okay, so on the left pane, you're going to click the third party root certification authority and you're going to find those certificates. Okay, so on the left side now, I'm going to go down to the third party, which is this one. Click the arrow to expand it and click on certificate. You do see some similarities in that some of your trusted root CA is also third party CA, like what we talked about earlier. Okay. And so how many certificates were issued in 
here. So you would see I have 37 on the bottom. So you just look at the bottom, okay? So we can say that we have 37. And then you can pick any of the two, right? And so we can say, it asks, identify two CA that were issued the th that was issuing the third party certificate in the listed to listed certificated. <laughs> I must be really sleepy when I wrote that sentence. Okay, so you can pick any of these. So we can say that okay, we can have we we have one from Global Sign that doesn't expire until 2029, right? And then another one, you can pick any of these. So issued by these are the issuer, right? So if you look at the CA, global sign root CA, there's global sign and there's global sign root CA. So what that means is that the, 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 the root CA is being trusted by their child, which is the global sign. Okay. So you do have some root and you do have some regular CA that's there. So I want you to pick two of these. You can pick the CAs like DigiCert and so on. Now, if you want to view them a little closer, you can double click and it tells you what kind of certificate it is, right? When it starts and when it expires. And all certificates are like this across all systems. It usually lists, right, the intention or the permissions and the details, okay? So put down the two CAs that you would see. Then you're gonna double click. So I asked you to double click the first one. So let's do that. So we have the same thing. So normally you would see the, the triple A, right? And triple A relates to authentication. So you would see that there. So if we double click that, this tells us that it's issued by triple A certificate services and it start in 2003, it goes until 2028. So we can answer the question, what is the purpose of this? And you can summarize this, you don't have to, you know. So the purpose is to really prove identity of the remote system. So when you look at the intention, you would know what it's used for, right? That it needs to use the certificate to validate a system that's remotely connecting. It also ensure that software is coming from the right software publisher. So authenticity with the software. It also is used to check if software has been altered or modified at publication. Why is that important? Because when you download software application, we want to make sure that it's authentic and it's not been jeopardized. It allows data on this to be encrypted. So when you're using encryption, <clears throat> when we're encrypting data on the drive, this allows us to encrypt the data. It's also used to protect email messages and so on, right? And then secure internet communication, ensure identity of the remote system, and then allow data to be signed with current time, so timestamp. So in this one, it encompasses a lot of the general things that you would see for the computer to be used, right? To connect to the internet and communicate safely, to verify the identity of the system, to encrypt, to encrypt data on this, to protect email. So it has the elements of security, and this is what you would see with various certificates. Now, after you look at the general information, it tells you the purpose, and you can summarize that. You can put that for 10. And then we would look at the valid date. Right, it starts in on the the end of two thousand three, and it goes until twenty twenty eight. Why was it so much earlier? Well, because 
this certificate was used in the older Windows OS as well, right? After XP. Like when you're looking at Windows 7, we transition to Windows 10 now, 11, right? And then it also lists the expiration date. So put that down here. Now let's look at the detail tab. So here you can find more technical information about that certificate. Okay, so first it's gonna tell you the version number and the serial number. So when you work with Command Prompt and PowerShell, in order to modify a certificate or even access it, you have to know its serial number. And the first one is usually 01, right? It really is, you know, and so you can take a look at the others, but the serial number, when you put that in, you have to specify like what, which certificate that you want to access. The signature algorithm, this is a SHA-1 RSA, and RSA uses SHA, remember we talked about that. The hash algorithm is a SHA-1, right? So knowing that what, can, what we can do in reporting is that we have to think about the vulnerability in the type of algorithm that's implemented for services using these certificates, right? SHA-1 was, it has flaws, so we transitioned to SHA-3, but as our system is still using some of the legacy algorithm or the algorithm that might be having flaws, we have to keep that in mind, okay? So on the public key, when you click the public key, it shows you this, this is the public key, the size of the key, the type is RSA, and the size is 2048 bits. Okay, so which step am I at? Step 11. You can write down the information when you review that certificate. Any question? So now we can click on certification path. And AAA is really tied back to Sectigo, which is the original entity that managed AAA. So what is the path? Just put down Sectigo. And the status, it tells you the status down here that it is okay. Now, if the certificate has been revoked or something like that, it will tell you that in the status information. Any questions? Then once we have the general information recorded and answer the questions from the details to certification path, we can click OK, right, to close out that certificate. Now, uh, since some of you are still working on that, let's look at one that has expired, right? So I click on one that's, that was expired in 2021. As you can see, right, it tells you that the certificate is expired. Can you remove that certificate? Um, not recommended because we want tracking in the certificate and it's used the related to various services. So you can revoke a certificate. You can, you know, you can manage it on the CAS. Okay, so we're done with Microsoft Management Console. Do you have any questions for me for certificate in MMC? So after today's session, you can add to your resume, right? Accessing Microsoft Management Console, MMC, to view certificates, right? Or to assess certificate. So that's what you're able to do today. All right.
So after we're done with MMC, we can close it. And if it asks you to save, if you want to save, you can, but the system gets deep free. So we're gonna say no. You can save it to a drive. You can save it to a computer and so on. Next, we are going to use CMD, but keep in mind that we are gonna run it as administrator. So search, we're gonna do CMD and then right click choose run as administrator. Let me change the font. Okay. So we are gonna use the command assert util. So anytime that you need to access certificate in command prompt, you would use assert util dash now this is the type remember earlier we were looking at computer right right now we are going to view certificate that's related to the user account okay and so let me move this up a little so i am at step 17. User store. Now, if you try this on your Windows 10 PC at home, it's different. Every system is used differently and it has different applications, different requirements, different things that's installed. So when you do that, what you're gonna see is gonna give you the summary of your certificate. It's gonna start at certificate zero, right? And you saw earlier, I went too far there. It ended up with 11. So I have 12 certificates. Okay. So here we can say 12. So when you look at the first certificate, it will tell you just like how you've seen it in MMC, First, it's gonna give you the serial number, okay? Then it's gonna tell you who issued that. That's Adobe, okay? And then the intermediate CA, remember we talked about, there's a root, there's an intermediate, and there's a child CA, certificate authority. So this was issued by Adobe intermediate CA. Location, right valid time right so this is like equivalent to valid from and to right earlier we saw that this is a non root certificate and this is a hash which is in sha one and on this one this is not a key provider information okay and it doesn't have private key and things like that for encryption but if you do look at some of the other ones, right, um, you would see. So, question. Okay, so answer these questions. When you look at the first certificate, certificate zero, So anytime that you need to use command prompt, right, to look at your certificate, you need to use the cert util, the type of certificate, user or computer, right? And then this is specifically to my certificate. So remember earlier it says my user account, but in command prompt, if you put the whole thing, it doesn't take it because they only have a certain location, the variable that stores that. So it's the way the program is written. Okay, so you can refer to Microsoft documentation for additional tutorial on this. So after this, you can also add to your resume, right? Ability to use cert util in command prompt to view user certificates. Okay. All right, any question? Okay, so now we are going to
tap over to PowerShell. So I want to give you three different flavors today for certificates so that way you know how to do it. So you don't have to have a one way to do things, right? All systems have multiple ways to view things. And in some cases, you might only be able to access PowerShell or just command prompt on the server and you have to look at these things for security reasons. So we are gonna go ahead and search for PowerShell and we're gonna right click and choose run as administrator. Now I am at step 19. Okay. So we can look at the digital certificates by using this. So all of your certificates, what it's saying that it is storing in a directory or a folder call at this location, okay? So this is why earlier when you use command prompt, you have to say my, because it's actually retrieving that from a location in the storage, okay? So we can use this command. And unlike command prompt, when you access it in PowerShell, it looks a little different where it doesn't give you more details. It's not as verbose. So it's gonna give you more of a summary, but it does have all the elements that you see. It just, you just need to expand it a little bit more. So it's just, the display is a little different, but you're still gonna get a general idea on how many certificates you have for that user, right? and who issued it. So depending on the administrator, they would choose to use whichever tool. If you're a graphical user interface person, use Microsoft Management Console. If you like command line, then use these, okay? But in PowerShell, a little different in how you're using your command is that you are accessing a folder where it stores the certificate, okay? So as I do that, take a screen capture. You can use SNP or Alt Print Screen and then paste it. And then how many certificates are listed? It should be the same, it should be 12. Mm -hmm. You can count them, but it's exactly the same one as the command prompt because it's the mine. Okay, so that should be 12 as well. So now I'm gonna show you another way that you can find this, okay? Four ways. So now we're gonna use a file explorer. So er, now when you look at this, you say, oh, it's at a location. So I can definitely find a folder if I'm, I can access it, right? If I have the privilege to do that. So we can simply copy this, okay? And then you can use even your browser to do this, but Go here to MVC. At home, you should have a, a file explorer on the bottom. You're gonna open this up and on this bar right here, click it and you're gonna paste it. Okay, paste it there. So open up the MVC folder and paste it onto your explorer bar. And there you go. You will see those certificate files. Now, if you try to open these files, Windows is going to say, oh, I don't know what you're trying to do. I don't know which application you want to use to open these files. It's going to pop up that window, right? So in MMC, MMC is better at this where it takes those files and translate it to an interface so you can see. Or in command line, you can actually look at the certificate in details. That's a little better. But what I'm intending to show you is that these certificates are files that exist in the folder. So when they issue you a certificate, it saves it as a file and it's at this location by default. Okay, unless the administrators moved it. So when you're investigating Windows system, 
this is where you go to find those files, or this is how you would be able to access those files, okay? And so today you, found, you have four ways to really access these certificates. The last way you can't really view them, but you know, you know, you see how, you know, when they were saved and, and where they are, okay? Any questions? All right. So take a screen capture for lab submission. So I'll print screen from, from here or SNP. And then how many? It should be 12 as well, right? Because it's the my certificate. Now at home, when you do this again, you try to repeat the steps, it's gonna look a little different, right? You might have four, you might have six, you might have 56, who knows, depending on what you use your certificates with. Okay, any question regarding certificate? So in the later class, right, ideally they should show you like 40C is a Windows class, um, or the server class you might, or and system administration class, you might have a way to uh, set up the CA. But if you do have me for other classes that deals with server, if I have time, I would, I normally, you know, show you how to install all the roles and set that up with Windows Server. All right, let's work on encryption. Any question relating certificates for now? Okay, so part B is encrypting file. And so Microsoft uses two different dates, right? When you encrypt files and folder, it uses EFS, which is encrypting file system. This only works if you format your Windows system using NTFS. If you use DXFAT or FAT, which stands for file allocation table, it does not work. So. The benefit of using NTFS is the elevated security, and that was the intention behind Windows NT and onward, okay? So Windows 7, Windows 10, if you format it with NTFS, you will be able to access EFS. Now, if you want to encrypt the entire drive, you would use BitLocker, okay? And BitLocker only exists in professional or enterprise edition of Windows client system like Windows 10 or Windows 7. So we are going to first look to see if we can do EFS. So you are gonna do services. So at home and you're trying to encrypt, you're like, ah, oh, I don't have it, right? To go check your services. Okay, so in services, you can click the name to categorize it, but all you have to do is, how do you know if they have BitLocker or not? the services are listed there, right? So if I need to encrypt drive on these because they're using the enterprise edition, you should have it. But you can go down and you can look for EFS, which is here. Okay. I don't think we can do the rest of this because they have set this on manual. So I, I just, I'm just gonna give you a warning. That's why I wrote that, that step. So I want to show you how you, you can go through and set it up and, and be able to use it because most of the time this is, this is set up to be manual. It's triggered at start. So we'll see, okay, depending on the image. So in order to, let me double check something. Hold on real quick, okay. Oh, it is there. Okay. So never mind. <laughs> I was worried. Okay. So um this, right? You you can if at home and your EFS is the the option is not highlighted. I'm gonna show you what that is. Then you can go here and then you can you can activate it. Okay. This is where you can stop and start services. So for example, if I'm being hacked and there's, you know, you know that if they're using a certain service, pull up your services manager and just stop that service right away. Okay. And then pull the cable because 
if they are already there in your system, likely that they will progress into other areas. And that's the same thing with the server. So if you do, if, if they're attacking the now of service, right, pull the cable, pull the plug on that server, but activate your, your failover server first. So a way on the software level, logically we can stop something is we simply right click that service and stop it, right? And on the server, it would have different manager component to do that. All right. So what I want to show you here is that you can go into services and you can look at that. The setting for the setup, it's manual. Oops. Not manual L, manual. So how do I know that? If you look at the encryption file system here, right? See how it says manual trigger at start. That means that when your system start, right? It's gonna trigger. Now some services are running. So it's running in the back like this, okay? So when your processor, when you're looking at a system that's like really slow, that's sluggish, usually there are a lot of services that are running at once or at start, okay? And you can do that with task manager and such, but you can go in here and you can stop certain services as well. Okay, question. Okay, so I'm here, I answer this question, right? And then now I move on to the next. So I want you to make a new folder on your desktop and you're gonna encrypt it, okay? So right click on anywhere on your desktop, click new, make a folder. We're gonna call this test one. Okay. And then inside it, we're gonna make a file, okay? Open up the folder, right click click new, and then we are gonna do a text document. We're gonna call it test one as well. So now we have a file in a folder. So I'm at step 30. Okay, we can close this. But what I want to show you is you can right click, choose properties, and minimize the zoom. And here you can click on advanced button on the general tab, okay? To encrypt file using EFS or folder using EFS, you just select this. If you compress, you select the other option. Now, if this is grayed out, that means that your services for EFS is not enabled. That feature is not enabled or it's not available in your system. Okay, then we click apply and it's gonna tell you, since you encrypt the folder, do you want that, that property to be carried into all the, the files within, right? So we're gonna say yes, unless you only want the folder, normally we would have the inheritance carried into all the sub objects. So we're gonna say, okay, and click okay. So you notice that it puts a lock here, okay? In the past, Microsoft, if you do this on Windows 7 or the earlier version, it actually changes the color. So now it puts a lock, okay? And then it also puts a lock on the file. So that's how you can tell that whether the file is encrypted or a folder is encrypted, okay? So, I put change color, but I meant, did it change, right? Did the folder look change, okay? You can say yes, lock is put on folder name. And the same thing with the file. So I gotta modify this. Did the file change? It, the file didn't really change. The file name changed, okay? It puts a lock, lock is put. So I want to show you that once you encrypt it, right, it shows this little lock, okay? 
Now, the person who encrypts the file can decrypt the file. Who's another person that can decrypt the file when that person's not there, when the user is not there? Who do you think? The admin, right? The admin can take over because in the case where you fire that user in the company, the administrator, the system administrator, the local system administrator can access it, okay? All right, so let's, now we're gonna do command prompt. Lovely, right? Back to CMD, use run as administrator. And then you are going to make, you're gonna go to CD desktop, just like how we use a graphical user interface. So here, I'm here at step 39. And I'm going to make a folder called test two. Okay, so MKDIR test two. So after I access the desktop, I can make a folder called test two on desktop. I want to see if that folder is made. So I simply call DIR to list all the content of that directory. Okay, so it's here. <laughs> it's not Linux. I know. <laughs> In Linux, we would use I'm LS, sure. but yeah. So I know, I just use Linux all day today and then, okay. Now, once we see it, that's good, we made it. So now we are gonna go into it, CD, test two. Now we're gonna open up the folder and we are gonna make a file, right? We saw this in the assignment and other labs before, so we're gonna do an echo, right? This is a secret file, and we're gonna point it to test2.txt. And so you wanted to see if it's made, you're gonna do a DIR again, right? It has that there. So I am here at step 44. Now we're gonna encrypt, okay? You have to be in that folder to encrypt it, okay? So we are in test two folder. So now we can encrypt that folder. If you move back one step thinking, oh, I need to be on the outside, right? It's gonna actually encrypt the desktop. So we want to do a cipher command and slash E stands for encrypt. Okay. And it says converting files from plain text to cipher text. So it scrambles it now, right? And it says here, the ciphertext may leave section of the old plain text on the disk volume. So if somebody get a hold of the disk, they can still retrieve your plain text, keep in mind, okay? But it's just written in a different location as an encrypted text. It is recommended that you would do a cipher with an option W and the directory to clean up. So if you want to get rid of the old plain text that's stored somewhere else, you would do this and the directory, just plug in your, your directory there, okay, your folder. All right, so now you know how to use the cipher command. And then now we are going to do a DIR. So because it's still able to see this, right? But only you who encrypts it can open it. You see? Okay. Proven case. Uh, desktop, test two, right? It puts a lock on there, right? We encrypt the file, not the folder. So now if you want to encrypt the folder, you have to move back and then put in the path. However, I want to show you how. So does the file name look different than, no, right? File name stays the same. 
because from a command line level, you can't really tell the difference because it's just going to show the same file name. But if you want to really see the little lock, you go to the graphical user interface and you would see that it puts the encryption on there. You see? Any question? I wish they do a little better on Windows with this, like put an asterisk or some kind of symbol to indicate, right, on the command prompt level, but it is what it is. Future improvement. <laughs> All right. So now, because we're gonna move back one step, so cd dot dot. Okay, we're back to desktop and we're gonna do a DIR. Remember that I didn't really encrypt test two. I am I was in test two to encrypt its file. So it's gonna stay the same. And even if you encrypt it, the folder name is gonna stay the same, right? So at this point, what, what I want to do is if I wanna encrypt everything in here, I can do cipher slash E and it will encrypt all the desktop content, which I don't want. Right. So if you want specific folder, you just have to put in the path C user MVC desktop test to blah, blah, blah. OK. All right. So if you did it on the root, on the root folder, could you like encrypt the whole? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> So the root folder is what C drive, right? Yeah. So yeah, you can go to C and then do cipher E, or you can actually use. So what it's gonna do is gonna notify you that it doesn't. It's the content is a lot, right? It's gonna use resources. It's gonna refer to BitLocker. So you would use BitLocker instead. What makes more sense to really encrypt the entire drive, which you don't want to do because your OS is on it, and then just that's just a mess, right? Okay. So now we are here, right? We are now going to go, we are in the desktop. So we're going to go to test one and we are going to try to decrypt our, our files in test one. Okay. So CD test one. And then we're going to do a cipher slash D to decrypt. And because we encrypted earlier using the graphical user interface, we can definitely decrypt it, right? So now it tells you that it decrypts okay because you are the person that encrypts it. So therefore it simply decrypts it really quick. Easy, right? Now, so after we decrypt it, we're gonna move back to desktop. And then we're gonna do the same thing for test two. So cd dot dot. And then we're gonna go into test two again. Oops, sorry, cd test two. And then we're gonna do a cipher D and it decrypts the test two file. So if you have a bunch of files in there, it's gonna tell you how many files, how many folders it decrypts. And EFS simply is used for files and folder and it's definitely convenient and quick. Where if you want to encrypt the whole USB drive or something like that, because you're carrying it around, it has secret information, then you would use BitLocker. And BitLocker, when you do that, keep in mind that it is slow, right? because it has to access your drive and then encrypts the content of it. Um, it's gonna, when you go through it, it's gonna tell you, number one, how do you wanna export your key or you wanna print out your key or how you wanna set up your key. And then when you decrypt it, you have to input the long string of keys and then it's gonna activate the hash and decrypt. Okay. So most people use third party tools for, for drive encryption. All right, so when we're finished, take a screenshot of this and we are done. Any question? Short and light today. If you, if you need help or have any question, let me know. Make sure that we submit this by Sunday. You don't have to do it today. 
I am gonna get all your grades updated by tomorrow. I'm a little tied up today. I intended to do some last night. I did some class last night, but for your class, I will whip that out by tomorrow night. And then let me stop recording.